Good morning, everyone, again. How are we? Oh, dear. Is it that bad? You're okay. Are we all right? Yeah, okay. 14 of you, good. That's good. Okay. All right. So, here we go. Thank you, Jeff. Really helpful to have a little bit of context um, for that passage, a, a hostile audience that Jesus is speaking to. We heard from Ellie last week the, where Jesus said, I am the gate, and he surprised his listeners because we all thought he was going to say, I am the good shepherd, but he went, no, I am the gate. And we heard that, he, uh, as Ellie said, that Jesus was saying, I am the gateway to salvation. If you want to know where to access salvation, healing, wholeness, restoration, I am the gateway. He says that doesn't he? And, uh, and then, we didn't read it here, so here are all the I am sayings. So remember, I am, Jesus is evoking the name, Yahweh is evoking the name of God, I am who I am, when he says this. And what the Gospel of John, the writer of John, is doing is he's revealing slowly more and more revelation of the nature of the Christology, the, the, the nature of the Christ as we go through this Gospel. And in verse 10, um, uh, just before Jeff um, read, and I didn't, I didn't put it in the verse, um, in the reading, because we know it so well. Do you remember, Jesus says, the thief comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But then he says, and well, we love this as evangelicals, all Christians love quoting this, and I have come that they may have life, and life to the Oh, yes. Okay, I can hear the energy now. We're waking up. Yes, we want a bit of life. We want a bit of abundance. We want a bit of fullness of life, don't we? Yes, yes, Lord, please. What is the good life? What is the good life? And our rabbi says this. I tell you what, I'm going to frame it for you. I'm going to frame it with a metaphor. I am the good shepherd. Okay. <laughs> is, that, is that the key to the good life? Actually, yes, it is. It's an amazing, amazing metaphor. And I wonder whether we've heard this metaphor so much before. We've heard, yes, the listeners of Jesus' time would have been so familiar with this. God is my shepherd. They would have seeped. They would have heard that tune many times before. And we, too, have heard this tune many times before. God is our shepherd. Jesus is our shepherd. And I think we can become a bit immune to it, can't we? The tune can become a bit of a jingle in the background. Yeah, 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 Jesus is my shepherd. But what does he actually mean by that? And I think there's some, there's some grit to it. There's, there's, there's something very challenging in this image. Um, because, you know, those of us who are clergy, we do quite a lot of funerals. And uh, Looking at Julie, I think you've done a fair few funerals in your time. And I'm imagining, Julie, when people ask, uh, you know, a reading and they say, well, we'd love to have... Psalm 23. Psalm 23 is such a beautiful psalm that resonates deeply, whether you're a Christian or not, that idea that God is my shepherd, who is shepherding me, who is nurturing me, who is looking after me. It's is so comforting, isn't it? It's so comforting. We like the sound of it. And Tim Keller, the writer, he's, he said some great stuff on this. He said, we like the sound of the Lord being our good shepherd, but... We're less keen on the reality of it. What is the reality of God being our shepherd? And there's a key metaphor, there's a key aspect to, our, to this metaphor here. And it's one that we sort of, you know, yeah, yeah, we accept, but the reality of it is quite tricky. And it is the fact that it's saying that we are sheep. Okay? We're sheep. We're sheep. I don't know whether you know much about sheep. I was doing a little bit of research on sheep. There's really not a lot of very interesting things to say about sheep. No offense. Okay? They're a bit boring. They're not very intelligent. And I did some research. I found two interesting things and a raft of quite tedious things that farmer websites thought were really interesting, but I wasn't very interested. Uh, uh, two of them were. The first one is... Uh, Sheep have uh, rectangular eyes or uh, eye eyeballs. No, they don't have rectangular eyeballs because that would be a contradiction in terms. They have a rectangular irises, yeah? So they can see peripherally. Apparently, they've got poor vision, but they can see badly all the way around. <laughs> so if you're a predator, all they're seeing is there's a blurry thing running at me from the side coming at. So that's an interesting thing, yeah, kind of. 
Uh, one, another interesting thing, they, they can smell from little glands here. That's quite cool. And also, hilariously, they can smell from glands in their feet. What? Why, God? Why? I, I just like, why would they want to just sort of go, is that, oh, that smells nice. I'm going to eat that. Those are the two only interesting things I found about sheep. Oh, dear. Okay. Uh, but, and I'm not sure Jesus had those two things in mind when he was talking about sheep and shepherding. He wasn't thinking about, I maybe he didn't even know. That would be weird, isn't it? Well, of course he didn't know. He was fully human. I mean, he certainly didn't know they had smelly glands on their feet. Well, maybe he did. Something for another sermon, maybe. But I think he had this in mind when he was thinking about sheep. Slightly derogatory. Here is a little video of a sheep that's stuck. And it needs rescuing. And look what it does. Fly! Oh, my goodness. That is a prophetic image of the condition of all our humanity. That is the human condition right there. Thank you for your rescue. And wah, plop right back in. Amazing. You see, many of us, we long to be the rescuer in that picture. We are the rescuer. I'm really quite capable. I'm quite intelligent. I got it from here, God. Thank you so much for rescuing me. And yeah, straight back into the gap. Jesus didn't say, I am the tamer and you are the wild horses. He didn't say that. That would have been cool, yeah? He said, I am the shepherd and you are the sheep. And why? Why the metaphor? Why this? Because, because without a shepherd, the sheep will die. Less so in this context, but in the ancient Near East, without a shepherd, the sheep will die die. They, they cannot survive in the wild on their own. They have no real sense of direction. They have no sense of what to eat. If, if the, they, they might eat poisonous plants unless they're told by the shepherd not to. They can get stuck on their back like turtles and they can't move without the shepherd coming and rolling them back onto their feet. Am I sounding a bit harsh on sheep? It's a slightly derogatory metaphor here. And it's what Jesus is saying in this metaphor is that I need complete, I need the sheep to have complete reliance on me, the shepherd. It means complete obedience to the shepherd, a word that I think we sometimes hold not too sure about, this word obedience. And so when I read this, when I was reading it this week, and I'm honest with myself, there's a part of me that resists the sheep thing, okay? Yeah, yeah, I love you being the shepherd, but a sheep Lord, it might have been easier if you had said, rather than I am the good shepherd, is I am the good coach. That would have been good. A bit more contemporary. I am the good coach. Because sometimes I think that we treat Jesus like our coach or our consultant, yes? Who does what we ask him to do when we ask him to do it. I'm a bit stuck. Can you come and pull me out? Thank you so much. I've got it from here. You know, I've got it from here. No, 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 you don't need to come. You don't need to come with me into the pasture. I know what I'm doing. I'm quite clever. I'm quite, you know, um, self-assured. Uh, I, 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 I can make sound decisions. I've got it from here, Lord. But within the confines of this metaphor, shepherd and sheep, Jesus doesn't allow us to have that kind of autonomy, so to speak. He doesn't. There's no ring, room for that kind of thinking. Sheep need a shepherd or they die. That, that, that's what they would have understood as they heard this metaphor. And it's kind of offensive. It's, it's slightly offensive to us. And we need to realize and understand that the, the gospel, the, the Christian story, there's, a, there's an offensive aspect to the gospel. Do we know why it's offensive? Do we? Because it's offensive, because it's saying that the sheep cannot live life independent of the shepherd. You cannot flourish independent of the shepherd. You can't. You die. That's what he's saying here. Really? That's a bit offensive. Yes. That is the, 
offensive nature of the gospel. The shepherd does what the sheep cannot do for themselves. And we'll come to that a bit later. What can they not do for them? They can't die for themselves. But the shepherd can. And Jesus does just that. He does what we cannot do for ourselves. That is the offensive aspect of the gospel. It offends our humanity. I got it from here. I know what I'm doing. You know, there are many images of God in Scripture. There's the Father, there's Rock, there's Judge, there's Friend, there's King, there's Refuge. And maybe more than any other, the shepherd image commands access to every part of our lives. That's what Jesus is saying, is I want access to every part. You need to give me access to every part of your life. Because you're not going to survive without me. That is one of the key aspects of this metaphor. And as I was writing this, I had a little prayer moment. And I'm going to punctuate the next uh, 12, 13, 15 minutes um, with little prayers. Because I prayed this. I said, Lord, sorry where I've treated you as a life coach and not my shepherd. What areas of my life have I been withholding from you? Social life, my political life, sexual, relational, work life, thought life, what I watch. That's a little prayer, a little thought I throw to you. Maybe you could echo that. But why should we follow this shepherd? I've talked a lot about sheep already, but why the shepherd? What is it about this shepherd? I've just got three short points that I'm going to make um, about this shepherd. Three short points. And the first one is this. The good shepherd is invested. What do I mean by that? The good shepherd is invested. It says in verse 12, the hired hand is not the shepherd who owns the sheep. So when he sees the wolf, the hired hand sees the wolf, he abandons the sheep and runs away. There were two kinds of shepherds in the ancient Near East. What were they? The first one was the hired hand we have here. Who is the hired hand? If you were the owner and you couldn't be bothered to look after your sheep or you were doing other things, you would hire someone to look after them, but they weren't invested in your sheep. So if, if there was danger, if there was a threat to their life, they're out of here. I'm not going to be sticking around as a bear. Would it have been a bear? No, as a big cat. Wolf, thank you so much, would come and peripheral, <laughs> peripheral from the periphery in blurred, come and steal the sheep away. The hired hand would leave because they're not invested in the sheep. Whereas the shepherd that Jesus is talking about here is the one who owns the sheep. And this is crucial. The shepherd's wealth, the shepherd's livelihood was in the sheep. Actually in the sheep. There's my wealth. There's my treasure. The sheep were literally the shepherd's treasure. And so they would look after them and do everything they could do to make sure that the sheep would flourish because they had invested their wealth, their treasure, into the sheep. Tim Keller again, I love this. Um, When Jesus calls himself the good shepherd, he's saying that his people are his pride and joy and glory. In being our shepherd, this is key, God has voluntarily bound up his honor and glory and joy with our honor and glory and joy. How extraordinary. I went to a, um, a, what do I go to? A talent show, my kid's school. A sort of school's got talent kind of thing. And and I I was looking around and I could see, because all the parents were there with the competitors. and, and, And we were all beaming. We were glowing with the pride. And it's not a sort of, my kid's better than... It wasn't that. It was just a, a thrill because having, you know, we, we pour our investment, some of us, a lot, yes, investing love and time. And it was lovely what Vicky said um, about Pearl and, and James. You know, a pouring our, our investment into our children. And when we see them being gloried in their, in their gifts and skills, then we glory in that and they're part of their honor and skill and glory, we, we sort of enjoy, don't we? And there is that kind of mutuality in this dynamic between God, the Father, who has created his children, and us, his sheep. The shepherd has invested himself into the sheep. When the sheep go wrong, how much does he weep? 
because he has invested so much in his sheep. So we obey this shepherd. We obey him. Yes, we will follow you, shepherd, because you are a good shepherd, not out of duty or fear or obligation, but because we know the shepherd is invested. He wants the best for us, and he, has, he is committed to our flourishing. He's committed for our lives. He's committed to our joy. He's committed to your joy and my joy as the good shepherd. So what do we do with that information? Maybe tomorrow we wake up wonder what the first thing that you think of when you wake up. Perhaps tomorrow morning, the first thing you might, might think of as you wake up, wake up is, Lord, thank you. As the good shepherd, you, have, you are invested in me, that I am your treasure. I'm your treasure. I am your prize and joy. And I thank you. And imagine if that thought becomes the fuel for our lives for the rest of the day, becomes the fuel that charges and energizes everything we do. Because if everything flows out of that place of acceptance, a, a place of it's, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who I am, it's who you are, it's who you are, it's who you are, that will, that will inform everything. So we are invested. This is the good shepherd. I don't know about you, but sometimes when I think of the good shepherd, I think, I think of he's compassionate, he's kind, he's attentive, and he's loving. But it's more than that. He is the good shepherd. He is the, he is the Mr. Miyagi of shepherding. Yes? Yeah? He's the Jedi warrior of, of shepherding. He's really good at it, and he knows what we need. He knows where we need to go, and he knows what we need. Key point. He knows what we need. And that's not always what we think we need. I haven't got time to go into that, but I just wanted to say that it's not always what we think we need. He knows as the good shepherd what we need. So that's my first point, he's invested. The second point is he calls his own sheep by name. He knows us. This is jumping back to verse three, which we read last week. The watchman opens the gate for him and the sheep listen to his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and he leads them out. You see, the good shepherd is so invested, he has a name for each one of us. He knows us. Now, I know that we've spoken endlessly up here and you've heard in Bible studies and all sorts of things that God knows me and he loves me. He knows me and he loves me. He knows me and he loves me. But do we actually know that in our, in our Noah? <laughs> you know, someone said in our Noah, that the place of knowing. I am known. You are known by name. And the name, the name doesn't just mean, yeah, my name, Brian. Oh, it's Tom, actually. I don't know why I said Brian. Why, why, I, I know that he knows my name, but he knows my personality. He knows my story. He knows my history. He knows my identity. There is nothing I can do that can surprise him. That video was surprising, but for the Good Shepherd, <laughs> That's not surprising. It's disappointing because it hurts us. It hurts the sheep, but it doesn't surprise him. I find that very freeing, that God is not surprised by the things I think and do. He isn't surprised by it. He knows me. It also said in that little verse, the sheep listen to his voice. This is key, I think, in this. The sheep listen to his voice. You know, the picture that Jesus paints in this big sort of chapter is that there are a lot of voices out there. There are a lot of people wanting to shepherd the sheep. Aside from the good shepherd, there are many shepherds vying for influence over the sheep. It's the stranger, the hired hand, the watchman. But, uh, and there's a sense here that w do we know the shepherd's voice? Do you know? Do I know the shepherd's voice, because when I know that voice, when I know in my knower <laughs> that voice, then it, it helps me discern that voice from all the other shepherding voices in my life that are trying to draw me. Now, often with very good intention, trying to draw me, but they're not, they're not the good shepherd's voice. And I wonder, as I was writing this, this, this week, Lord, who, what are the voices that I'm listening to that are not chiming with the good shepherd's voice. I haven't got time to go into a lot of detail of that, but what are the voices? Can we pray that prayer this week? What are the voices I'm listening to that are not chiming with the good shepherd's voice? They may have good intentions. 
I'm thinking of, well, I mean, I wrote down a list of things as sort of media and, 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 and family, family, the power of family voices that have wonderful intention that, but may not chime with the good shepherd's voice. Past story, things that we've spoken over ourselves in our lives. What are we listening to? What are we listening to? You see, unless we find and follow the good shepherd, we will always find shepherding substitutes. There will always be, we have a, we're sheep, we need to be shepherded. We will always seek a shepherding voice. But Jesus is saying the good shepherd will lead you to the life of abundance. And the final point, so we've talked about he is invested, he knows us by name, he calls us and we need to listen to his voice. And then finally, the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. I've left the most important till last. Verse 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. And he repeats it in verse 15. I lay down my life for the sheep. Verse 17, the reason the father loves me is that I lay down my life. And then he reiterates that I lay down on my own accord. We're getting a sense here that this is one of the things that the shepherd does is he lays his life down. And here we get the offensiveness of the gospel. Remember that? Remember that we can't do what we think we can do on our own. We can't, the sheep can't die to save the flock. Only the shepherd can. And I love this. I love this little bit of um, biblical insight here. Um, it says, uh, so, uh, it says that the four, so where it says I lay down, um, the father lays down, uh, sorry, the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. That word for there is hupier, which can be, can be translated in the place of, instead of, as a substitute. The sheep cannot die for themselves, but the shepherd will die in their place. You see that exchange that takes place. That is what Jesus is pointing towards. He's pointing towards the cross, where that incredible divine exchange takes place. I die in the dark so that they might live in the light. I take their cross so that um, I take their cross so they can take my crown. I take their punishment so that they can have my reward. That is substitutional theology right there. He did for you and me what we cannot do for ourselves. He did for you and me at the cross, what we cannot do for ourselves. I'm going to invite the band up. There's a lot there in the 22 minutes. I have brokered with our children and families minister that, I'm, w w w w that they're expecting us at quarter two. I forgot to tell Vicky. Um, uh, but uh, did, a little, did a little negotiation on the side there. So we're okay. We're okay. I wonder where all that is landing with you this morning. How are you, how are you doing? So invest, he's invested. We're sheep. He's invested in us. He calls us by name. The good shepherd calls you. He knows your name. And he is calling to you, I believe, right now. He's calling you. He's calling you all the time, Tom. Come close to me. This is the good life. I started with the abundant life, the life in all in fullness. Lord, I long for life in all its fullness. I long for what you offer. And he says, yes, but it's costly. And it's costly. And the cost is this. You follow me. And it's not going to be easy. And I hope you haven't sounded like in this sermon I've been making it easy. It's not easy. But it is the way to abundant living and fullness of life. Shall we stand? Shall we stand? I was sitting, so I'm going to stand as well. Let's. Jesus, the Good Shepherd, is saying, Know my heart this morning. Know my heart. My heart is invested. My heart calls you by name. And I lay my life down. I do that which you cannot do yourselves. And we say, thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for that.